Take your Bibles this morning, if you would. Let's go to the book of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel, chapter 12. It is good to see each of you this morning. Brother West has been doing a Thanksgiving series, and I've been doing a series on the life of David. And so, Brother West is not here, so we're not going to give thanks today. <laughs> we're going to talk about the reproach of sin, all right, instead. And give thanks for that, I guess. Second Samuel chapter 12. We're going to talk about the faithful wounds of a friend. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 27, 6, faithful are the, are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful. The kisses of the enemy are deceitful. You've heard the old expression that uh, your enemy will stab you in the back, but your friend will stab you in the heart. And that sounds awful, but uh, it's true. And, and basically what that statement is saying is that a friend will come and tell you the truth, even if it hurts. Because the truth is what's good for us, and that's exactly what you're going to see here in our text today. What's happening in 2 Samuel 12 is something that is fearful. It's something that is rare. But it is something that can be beautiful if it's done correctly. And it is con confrontation is what you're seeing in 2 Samuel chapter 12. When it's done biblically, it can help some things. You know, there are appropriate times for one Christian to confront another Christian. And there are appropriate biblical ways in which you can confront other people. In fact, in some ways, it is our duty as Christians... To confront people who have fallen into sin. Other Christians, that is. Uh, often people fall into sin, they lose sight, and, uh, and they can't see the danger that's in front of them because their sin has blinded them and they've been deceived by it. But in Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, Paul instructs us, he said, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, not ye which are going to church all the time, not ye which are older or younger or smarter or more knowledgeable. Ye which are spiritual. And there's a difference in all those things. Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself. Lest thou also be tempted. And then he says, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Isn't this exactly what Jesus taught us? Uh, to do in Matthew chapter 7 when, when Jesus was talking about if you see that your brother has a, a moat in his eye or a, and, you, and he says something about going in and making sure that there's nothing in your eye before you try to remove the moat from their eye. He said, your, your neighbor, your brother has a splinter in his eye and yet you have a beam in your own eye. How in the world are you going to help your brother get the splinter out of his eye when you got a beam in your own eye? We call those people beamers. Don't be a beamer, all right? People who've got their own problems, but they're always worried about somebody else's problem. No, Paul said in Galatians, ye which are spiritual. Somebody who's got the things in order, who's trusting Christ. Then he says, in the spirit of meekness, go to them. Not in the spirit of contempt. In the spirit of meekness, go to them and, and try to help bring your brother out of that and restore them. And, and what's happening here, in a brilliant move, God finally brings... A, a man of God, a man of integrity, right in front of David. And if you were here last Sunday, we were covering David's uh, discrepancies, David's issues with Bathsheba as he stole the man's wife, uh, uh, Uriah the Hittite, stole his wife, and they conceived the child together. And David, in an attempt to cover up his sin, actually has Uriah murdered. And David is happy with all of this. But somebody has to confront the issue and, and God brings a man of integrity in front of him to tell him the truth. A faithful man who is a faithful friend who will tell him something. And Nathan does something here that is critical. And when it comes down to the faithful wounds of a friend, we have to be very careful that we balance out a couple of things in our lives always. We have to balance out truth and love. And balance is always the most difficult th thing to achieve. Balanced diet, balanced schedules, a balanced life. But we have to balance truth with love. That's why the Bible says preaching the truth in love. Because 
Truth without love is cold and harsh, and it's unbearable. But love without truth is superficial, and it makes no difference. So you have to balance those two things out, and I don't think that we miss the mark here with this man and Nathan the prophet who comes. I don't think a confrontation has ever been so intense as this confrontation and yet been so brief and so effective. I mean, immediately, they get right to the point. Nathan shares a story with him. And when David is about to boil over in his own self-righteous indignation, Nathan reveals to him these words, Atah ha'ish, thou art the man, David. You're the one I'm talking about. And David crumbles in humility. And I imagine a scene here of relief came over him as David, the things that he had done secretly and willingly are now being being revealed as Nathan pulls back the veil of dishonesty and begins to reveal to David his own sin and reveal it before himself and before God. But we're going to look at this faithful wound of a friend here. Look in 2 Samuel chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. It says, And the Lord sent Nathan unto David, and he came unto him and said unto him, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing save one little ewe lamb, which he had brought up and nourished up, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It did eat of his own meat and drank of his own cup and lay in his bosom and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man that came unto him. But he took the poor man's lamb, and he dressed it for the man that was come to him. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold. Because he did this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said, Nathan said unto David, Thou art the man. Let's stop right there. I want to lay four thoughts on your heart today very quickly. Number one, let's think about the secret repercussions of David's sin. Everybody knows about what happens to David at the end of this story. At the end of this sordid affair, Hollywood affair, everybody knows about the things that David endured as a result of his sin, but there were some secret repercussions of David's sin. As I mentioned last week, there's a high cost to low living. And David's about to experience that. His sin was not immediately punished by God, but David was feeling the, the repercussions and the reeling of his sin already. He's already being affected by all of this. Between chapter 11 and verse 27 and chapter 12 and verse 1, there's a period of time that passes there of about 12 months. In that one-year period, there's no mention of David's sin. Not by David, not by God, not by anybody that we know of. It seems to be kind of a silent time, but there was a year of complete misery for David. David couldn't live in his sin and cover it up and, and live in an unconfessed state and be happy about it, as you can read about that in Psalm 51, and we will. You notice that it was a time of silence. One of the most miserable feelings in all the world is to know about your sin and try to keep it silent. To know that there's something deep in your heart and in your life that you don't want anybody else to know about. And yet, there it is, it's haunting you. And, and other people maybe are not hearing about it. Maybe other people don't know it. Maybe you've covered it up to some degree. But there's a misery that comes from having to live with your own sin and your own guilt. Of course, Bathsheba knew about his adultery. Uh, of course, uh, he knew about it. But did she know that he had killed her husband? That he'd had Uriah murdered? See, the problem with secret sin is that we're constantly having to live with the guilt that comes into our lives, even if nobody else knows about it. We're still bearing that burden. We're still bearing up underneath it. And I would imagine that every time that Bathsheba and David met and their eyes met, I would imagine flashes of guilt came over them as they tried to deal with and process the sin that's in their life that nobody wants to talk about. There are some repercussions to this, and it was a time of silence. It was also a time of sorrow. When we harbor sin in our lives, you can be sure of this, that there's no joy. 
You see, sin is a master thief. Sin will rob you of your joy. And joy is what comes from the inside of us, right? Not happiness, joy. I'm talking about the joy that comes from within your heart, that deep down the Holy Spirit is the one who produces that joy. Joy is one of the fruits of the Spirit. Joy is not a product of your circumstances. That's your happiness and your unhappiness. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. And when a person who is a Christian, who is supposed to be a man after God's own heart, is living in sin and hiding that sin and harboring that sin in his heart, listen, he grieves the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit is grieved in us, our joy is robbed from us. There's no joy. That's why he prayed in Psalm 51, Restore unto me, what? The joy of thy salvation. That's why he prayed that. There was no joy in his life. There's no peace. There's no happiness. David and Bathsheba couldn't really even rejoice over the baby that was coming. You remember, Mom and Dad, do you remember when you heard the news of your baby coming? I remember, I remember very well the news of my first child. I remember when I got the news. I remember how excited and happy that we were going to have a child. I remember I was working out for the electric companies out in the field, putting up poles in a field, an open field. And Kara called my cell phone because you couldn't text back then. There was no such thing, at least not in my world. And, and uh, I answered it. And she said, I got the ultrasound back. Do you want to know what we're having? I said, oh, yeah, I want to know what we're having. She said, we're going to have a baby boy. And oh, man, how excited, how joyful. Then we had another baby boy. And I mean, that's great. Then we had another baby girl. And man, I remember coming, she was born on a Friday. The next Sunday was Easter. We were here. And I held her up in front of the crowd right down here. She had a little bitty thing, you know. And then I remember the news of our last baby. It was 3rd of July. And I was out at Arvel Looney's house. And my wife didn't come, and she didn't come. She didn't come. She didn't come. Finally, she shows up. I said, where have you been? She said, I've been picking myself up off the floor. I said, what's wrong with you? She said, we're going to have another baby. <laughs> you know, and, you know, I tease about that. Of course, you wouldn't take any of those. I mean, man, you know, the Lord knows what he's doing. And, man, what a blessing. All four of my children have just been a blessing. But do you remember when you got that news and how you could just, your heart just rejoice? What a lot of people don't know is between my two boys and my two girls, we lost a baby. We lost a baby there. And, you know, it's amazing about that because when you hear that there's a baby coming, immediately your heart is set on that child. You don't know him. You don't know if it's a boy it's a girl. You don't know anything about that child. You just know that inside there is a child that God has given you. And your heart is set on that child and, and your heart rejoices. David and Bathsheba couldn't even experience that joy. Because this was a terrible time of sorrow. Because the joy of a child that they should have was just riddled by guilt because of the way that they had conceived this child. Anybody who's a parent remembers that joy that came over you when you heard this child was coming. David couldn't even rejoice. In Psalm 51, 3, David said, I acknowledge my transgression. And look at what he said. And my sin is ever before me. What does he mean by that? I think it means that David couldn't get past the guilt. No, no matter where he turned, Satan is always bringing his guilt up and his sin up, and it's right there. Everywhere he looks, he sees his own sin, and he feels his own guiltiness. And he couldn't even enjoy it. David knew. Joab knew. Surely some of the servants knew. But worst of all, God knew. God knew what David had done. It was in a time of sorrow for him. And he's trying to deal with it. So there were some secret repercussions to David's sin that nobody really even knew about. Notice, secondly, notice the sudden revealing of David's sin here. You ever wonder why it took God, why he waited a year to confront David on his sin? Perhaps David wasn't ready to deal with it. Because here, here's the truth. When we, when we harbor sin in our heart 
And, and we have to deal with it. What we tend to do is we, we tend to justify our own sin. And we, we, we try to excuse our own sin. And what happens in that time of unconfession, when we're harboring our sin and holding on to it, our hearts begin to callous just a little bit to where we don't even really feel the effects of the guilt much longer. And in fact, the longer you go on in that unconfessed sin, the less affected you are with conviction about it. Maybe David wasn't ready to deal with it. Perhaps God was waiting on the right time. I think perhaps God was, was waiting on the right man to deal with this sin. He which is spiritual, restore such a one. He's waiting on on Nathan. Nobody likes having their sin exposed. Nobody likes having it pointed out. And this effort that was going to take place here by Nathan and God was going to have some certain tact required. It required, first of all, it required a bold man of character. It had to be a bold man, because think about this. He's going to the king. And, what, and I admire Nathan. I mean, hats off to Nathan. How much boldness would it take to go into the king and say, all right, king, I got a story I want to tell you. And to confront King David. Listen, when you confronted the king, you could endanger your own life. But Nathan was a man of character. And he was a man that I think God had prepared for this. He was a faithful man. He was a friend of David. Nathan couldn't bear the injustice anymore. He must tell David. Now, I want you to know something here. Nathan was a friend of David. He's not a stranger. He's not a stranger, he's a friend, and he's an advisor. So it would have been very difficult for him to go to, to David and tell him these things. But listen, he's David's friend. And it wasn't just a sense of justice that caused Nathan to go into David. It was a sense of love for David. Here, here, here's something I think we all need to understand. That discipline is a form of love. Jesus said, whom I love, I what? I rebuke and I chasten. Nathan is going to David not just out of a sense of duty. He's not going to David out of a sense of great injustice. I think Nathan is going to David in a spirit of love because Nathan loved David. And David didn't even see necessarily how great his sin was affecting him. And here's the truth. If we love people and we say that we do, shouldn't our love cause us to confront people about their sin as well? And say, listen, friend, there's a problem here and needs to be addressed. But it's going to take a bold person with character and integrity to do that. It's going to take a spirit-filled person who can do it in a sense of meekness and fear, considering their own selves lest they also fall. It takes somebody who's doing it out of love, not out of self-righteous contempt. So often the problem with this confrontation is, is that people want to go to other people about their sin with a sense of self-righteousness as if they don't have any sin. Nathan goes with humility and meekness and with a great method that God has given him to reveal to David something because he loved David and he didn't want to see David go on in his sin anymore because he knew David's sin was going to bring destruction upon himself, himself and upon his family and upon his nation took a bold man of character. And if we love our friends, we'll tell them the truth. You know, Brother West brought up something last week that I thought was interesting. He talked about sharing the gospel with family and friends. And he talked about how so often we tend to shield our family and friends from the gospel truth. And he said, I don't understand it. He said, you ought to be begging us to go and speak to your family and friends. But it's true. So often people shield us uh, shield them from us. I mean, I don't know if they don't have any confidence in us, or they don't have any confidence in the gospel, or any confidence in the Holy Spirit. I don't know what. I don't know where the lack of confidence is. But there are people who will let their friends and family die and go to hell and never tell them the truth. You say, "Well, I love them too much to injure them." If you love them, you'll tell them the truth. Amen. Love doesn't let people die and go to hell un untouched. And Nathan couldn't go on anymore, but he was a bold man of character. It also would require a bold manner of confrontation. When you read in verses 1 through 4, I credit Nathan for his approach here. He basically wages psychological warfare on David. It's pretty clever what he did, actually. 
he entraps David with this psychological warfare, and he, he tells David a story, and what he does, he doesn't just go in and say, David, here's your sin, I know it, you know it, God knows it, do something about it. Instead, he goes in and he appeals to the good nature of David, because David did have a good nature. David loved people. David loved the Lord. David was just a sinner who was deep in his sin at this point. And he appeals to his good nature, and he says, David, let me tell you a story. There was a rich man, had all these flocks. And then there was a poor man who only had one little ewe lamb. And the rich man had a visitor that came by. And he didn't take it from his flock, but he went and took that one ewe lamb. And he took it, and he dressed it, and he gave it to his visitor, his traveler. David is so steeped in his own sin that when he's hearing this story, now all of us know the story, right? So when you're reading the story, you're going, oh, David, he's talking about you. Just like y'all do in church, oh, he's talking about so-and-so. Okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I hear him talking. I, I sure hope they're listening. David is so steeped in his own sin that he can't even hear himself in this story when it should have been obvious. But his manner about this, of this confrontation was genius. He, he appeals to David's good nature. He emphasizes the preciousness of that one new lamb to that poor man. And when David hears the story, in his own righteous indignation, he is livid and he is demanding justice. And it's amazing to me, just a little side note, it's amazing how people who are harboring sin in their own life can be so harsh on other people when they find out about their sin. We've all seen it. David, David is filled with indignation. He makes a decree in verses 5 to 7. Look down there with me. David, David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said, as the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. Careful, David. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing and because he had no pity. He makes a decree that this man will repay fourfold. And I want to tell you something. He signed his own sentence that day. But I want you to notice this. What happens when Nathan reveals to him who he's talking about? It's amazing to me that David could not hear himself in the story. But Nathan, without hesitation, draws back his sword and with the Holy Spirit of God drives it through the heart of David in one thrust. And he says, thou art the man. It's you, David. You're the one I'm talking about. You're the one who's taken the one new lamb. You have taken the wife of Uriah and then you took his life with the sword. Now I want to tell you something. At this moment, David is at a crossroad. But I want you to notice this. Number three, notice the spiritual response to David's sin. Perhaps one of the most difficult things in the world is to have people to look at and to deal honestly with their own sin. It's a hard thing to do. Matter of fact, Wednesday night I had this discussion with one of our church members. We were driving the bus together, and we were talking about uh, a family member that they were trying to witness to. And we were exploring reasons why people struggle to deal with their own sin and, and to come to grips with the fact that they're sinners in need of salvation, in need of grace. Hey, perhaps it's pride. David's at a crossroad right now where his pride is going to rear its ugly head. And David's going to say, you know what? David could have said, you know what? I'm the king. How dare you come in here and talk to me like that? How dare you accuse me of things you know nothing about? How dare you try to come in here and condemn me? David's pride could have reared its ugly head. I think for a lot of people it's what it is. When you confront them with their sin. I can't tell you how many people I've spoken to who in their own pride cannot see that they're a sinner in need of salvation. Can't see it. 
Perhaps it's the acknowledgement of hardships in their life. You know, some people will not, when they get to the point of decision about sin and about their need for salvation, will struggle because they think back to the fact that they've had loved ones who died. And if I admit, if I admit that my sin makes me blood guilty before God, and if I admit that without Christ I would die and go to hell, then I'm admitting and condemning my family members in the past to hell because I'm saying that this is the only way to heaven, and I know that they didn't get that done. So I think some people reject all of this because they don't want to condemn their family members in their mind. But I think the number one answer is this. People love their sin. People love their sin. And if they acknowledge it and deal with it, then they have to confess it and they have to forsake it. The Bible says in John chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, it says this, And this is the condemnation. That light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light. Men love darkness. They love their sin because their deeds are evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light. Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. David's at a crossroad. David's trying to cover up his sin. His pride hey, it could stop him. But you notice this. We see his confession. Look at verse 13. When, when Nathan drives this sword of conviction through his heart, in verse 13, David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. He makes the confession. Finally, David finally lets himself hear for the first time. His mind is clear. And for the first time in months, David looks at his situation with honest eyesight and says, I have sinned. I would imagine that when David prayed that, I would imagine that he wept. Anybody in here who's ever harbored sin in their life knows the relief that comes when you confess it. There is great relief when you go, it's over, the fight is over. I'm not going to hide it anymore, I'm going to confess it, I'm going to forsake it. And I would imagine at that moment, David knew he couldn't hide from his sin anymore. His sin had found him out, had caught up with him, and he confessed it, and he forsook it. But if you're ever going to make a comeback, you have to be honest about it, and you have to confess it. You cannot go on in neglected sin and expect it to come out right. We often fail to consider the gradual effects of the sin in our lives. In St. Louis in 1984, an unemployed cleaning woman noticed a few bees buzzing in and around her attic. They went in and out of her attic at her home. Since there were only a few, she really made no attempt to deal with the bees. She thought it was not a big deal. Over the summer, the bees continued to fly in and out of her attic while the woman remained unconcerned. She's completely unaware of the growing city of bees that were in her attic. The whole attic became a hive. And eventually the second story ceiling and floor caved in and fell into the bedroom. It collapsed under the weight of hundreds and hundreds of pounds of honey and thousands and thousands of angry bees. The woman escaped serious injury but she was unable to repair the damage of her accumulated neglect. Now, that's an interesting story, but it serves to make a point. That sometimes that's how we view our sin, as just a minor issue that's going in and out of our lives, not a big deal. We just let it go. But there is a long-lasting effect that is accumulated over time when we neglect to deal with the things in our lives that need to be dealt with. And there's always going to be a scar. You see his confession here. David confessed. We see his contrition also. Contrition is a state of being broken and remorseful and penitent. You want to deal with your sin? You want to really get your life back on the right track and, and clean the slate? It takes a humble and contrite spirit to do so. 
When you look at Psalm 51, look at it with me if you don't mind. If you got it there, it might, it'll probably show up on your screen there. Psalm 51, you're going to see David was a broken man. He said in verse 3, he said, For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. He said, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. He says in verse uh, 7, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. You see, there is brokenness in David's life and in his heart. He said in verse 9, Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Look at verse 16. He says, For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. He said, you don't want my offering, God. It isn't that you want my offering. It isn't that you want my sacrifice. Listen, God doesn't want your offering. He doesn't want your sacrifice. He wants a broken and contrite spirit before him is what he wants. He wants you to fling your pride to the side. He wants you to fling your sin to the side. He wants you to open up with honest eyes and say, there's my sin and I, I lay it before you. I confess my faults. And I have sinned against thee and against thee only, God. That's where David had came to in Psalm 51, a place of contrition. And I want to tell you something. I know people think David's a hero. Some people think David's a jerk. David's a man. David's a human. But a man who whose heart comes to that place right there, God can do things with. Amen. Our pride will keep us from coming to a place of contrition. I like what he said there. He said, you don't want my sacrifice. You don't want my offering. You want a broken, contrite spirit. What did, uh, what did the Lord tell King Saul? To obey is better than sacrifice. To obey. And David said, that's, that's what he wants. Notice his cleansing as well. We see his cleansing in verse 13. Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. The moment, the moment confession came from David's mouth, cleansing came from God's heart. The Lord has put away thy sin. David, it's, it was ugly, David. Hey, listen, it's all ugly. <laughs> we, we want to get on David about his sin. Oh, good Lord, have mercy on us. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. How many of us neglected to do what was right this week? How many of us neglected to carry out the gospel to people around us? How many of us forsook our duties and our commissions to Christ and dare we condemn David for his sin? I don't think so. Because to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. But the moment you confess it, the Lord will cleanse it. I'm so glad. I'm so glad for God's mercy. You want, you want to have Thanksgiving? Thank God for his mercy and grace that we don't deserve. Amen. For if we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to cleanse us of our sin, forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. I love it. Psalm 32, verse 1, says this. I'll read it to you. You don't have to flip there. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silence, this is David speaking, by the way, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. You see, when he was holding that sin in, he was eating him up on the inside. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledged my sin unto thee 
and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. He was cleansed. Friend, if you're harboring sin in your life today, confess it. Have it cleansed. I want to end with this thought right here. The serious results of David's sin. David was forgiven. But that does not mean that sin doesn't come with consequences. There were some serious consequences to his actions. There's going to be a high cost. Four things, very quickly, don't panic, I'll run through them. Number one, there were permanent consequences. Look at verse 9 with me. Wherefore hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do this evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore, here comes the permanent consequence. The sword shall never, never, never depart from thine house. Permanent consequences. It's not going to change. Now God did... Uh, give him a little reprieve from his sentence. He said, the man that did this shall surely die. And he said, the Lord has forgiven your sins, and listen, you're not, you're not going to die. But there are permanent consequences. The sword will never leave your house. It'll be in your family. It'll, it'll be a pain for him and for his family, for his nation from then on. He lost his children over this matter, didn't he? Man, I mean, the sordid, the sordid journey of how he lost some of his sons. Amnon, his son raped Tamar, his half-sister. Tamar was never the same, ever. She lost her mind, went crazy. Absalom killed Amnon for what he had did to Tamar. Joab killed Absalom for killing Amnon. And they lost their baby. Bathsheba's baby died, just as God said it would. Now David had said, the man that did this shall surely die and repay fourfold. God said, all right, I'm not going to kill you. But they lost the baby. Tamar was ruined. Amnon was murdered. Absalom was murdered. The man that has done this shall pay fourfold. David pronounced his own sentence and lived it out. Permanent consequences. Public consequences as well. Look at verse 12. For thou did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all of Israel. He said, listen, you're going, to, you're going to be dealt with publicly. Remember the old Hank Williams song, Your Cheating Heart Will Tell On You? It did. God exposed his sin. And he can't expose sin, and he will. David had kept his silence. And this, you know, this ought to help us before we take a step of disobedience to consider the outcome and how it might affect others. There were painful consequences. The baby died. His family was ravaged. Another, he lost another son. Adonijah was, was killed as well. A Amnon, Absalom, and Adonijah were all killed in a violent manner. The sword truly never departed from his house. Now, you young people, listen up. I'm going to talk to you all for a second. There are consequences to sin. And nobody wants to talk about it. Our society is so backward and twisted and perverted and awkward. And we're promoting all these issues. We've got all these social issues in America today. They're not, hey, listen, they're not social issues. They're sin issues. They're sin issues. Nobody knows what gender they are anymore. I mean, good grief. Nobody knows their sexual orientation anymore. Nobody restrains their desires anymore. Our young people are being taught that premarital sex is not an issue. All you got to do is turn on the TV to know that sexual promiscuity is being uh, is being promoted all across America. Marriage is being degraded and diluted. 
and the tidal wave of sin that happened in the 60s and 70s is still beating on the shores of America today. Disease is running rampant. Yeah, I had, a, I had a kid tell me one time in his high school in, in Texas that they tried to do a blood drive and, and the Red Cross couldn't take their blood because the high school, almost 50% of the students had a sexually transmitted disease. 44% was the number. Now, you young people, listen up. You can sow your wild oats and pray for a, a crop failure. But a harvest is coming. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Whosoever soweth unto the flesh, shall of the flesh reap corruption. But if you sow to the Spirit, you can reap life. And there are painful consequences. They're not going to tell you about that. The beer commercial is not going to show you the teenager that's dead. They're not going to show you that. Christians all over America defending alcohol. Yeah. Go talk to some parents. have lost children to drunk drivers. Go talk to drug addicts and ask them if there's painful consequences. Go talk to marriages that divorced after 38 years because people can't stay sober. Because we give in to all this garbage. We don't talk about the consequences in America. Every TV show's got a homosexual on it. There's consequences. Amen. I know. I, listen, I know. I know this ain't popular to talk about this stuff, but it's wrong. Amen. Whether people like it or not, it's wrong. Homosexuality is wrong. I don't hate homosexuals. I'm not a homophobe. I don't like their sin any more than I like my sin. You turn on the TV and everybody's sleeping there, everybody. And everything is hunky-dory. It's not true. There's painful consequences and harvest is coming. There's one more consequence. It's a profound consequence. And this is a factor that we rarely consider in our sin. In verse 14, God reveals a major issue that we don't think much about. He says... Howbeit, because by this decree, by this deed, pardon me, thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. What does that mean? Well, there's a profound consequence in the fact that David's sin has brought reproach upon the name of God. Hey, lay all the sexually transmitted diseases aside. Lay all the addictions aside. Lay all the death aside. Lay all that, all those consequences, lay them right over here. And come to grips with this. That our sin, our sin brings disgrace to the Lord Jesus Christ. And reproach to his name. God didn't brush over that. I mean, forget about what you did to Uriah. Forget about what you did to Bathsheba. Forget about the death of your baby and the, the wreckage of your family. Your sin, David, has brought reproach upon the name of the Lord. You've caused the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme him. And God in his holiness and justice has to deal with the sin of David. We ought to always strive, friend, to bring honor and glory to God. Maybe we have some things to deal with today. I don't know. We'll give you a chance. Our musicians are going to come. We're going to prepare to close. While they're coming, let me share a story I read with, uh, share a story with you I read this week. I heard about a father that had a young son, and every time his son 
would tell a lie, the father would drive a nail into a post so that he could see the nail and see the lie. But every time that his son told the truth and did that which was right, the father would remove it. He'd tell a lie, he'd drive another nail. He'd tell the truth and do that which was right, he'd remove a nail. The son matured to the point in his life where all the nails had been removed. But then he noticed something. He noticed all the scars that were left behind, even though the sin had been removed. There's a high cost of low living. In young people, there's going to be scars. They don't talk about the scars. Our sin left scars in heaven because Jesus bears those marks in his body still yet. And he went to the cross and he died there for our sin. That if we would confess it and forsake it, he'd forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Sin destroys. Sin decays. Sin devastates, but sin can be dealt with today. If you would just come and confess it before God like David did, you'll be forgiven immediately. Here's the thing about Jesus that I love, is when we come to him confessing our sins, we don't find condemnation. You might find that in other people. You might find it in churchgoers, good, good honest people sitting in the pew. You might find condemnation there. You won't find it in Jesus. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. All you got to do is come confess. You'll find cleansing and comfort.